Welcome to the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. The show covering all things health, wellness, culture, and more. The show for all of us who aren't old, we're better. Each week, we'll interview superstars, experts, and ordinary people doing extraordinary things, all related to this wonderful experience of getting better, not just older. Now, here's your host, the award-winning Paul Vogelzang. Welcome to the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. I'm Paul Vogelzang, and we have a fascinating interview with our returning guest, Dr. Andrew Lamb, who I will introduce in just a moment. But we're going to be talking about this fascinating world of medical innovation. It involves rivalry, the indomitable spirit of human progress, and this amazing journey through time as we will unravel with Dr. Lamb how the worst in people sometimes leads to the best for humanity. Imagine the relentless pursuit of breakthroughs that have saved millions of lives shaped by the hands of brilliant but flawed individuals. These were not saints, but driven, competitive beings whose envy, ambition, and rivalry, while often tarnishing their personal legacies, inadvertently spurred the most significant medical discoveries in history. In today's episode, we are honored to host returning guest and audience favorite, Smithsonian Associate Dr. Andrew Lamb. Dr. Andrew Lamb is a well-known surgeon, esteemed author, and assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Dr. Lamb takes us behind the scenes of his upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation titled, Rivalries in Medicine, How Humanity Can Benefit from the Worst in People. For more information about Dr. Lamb's Smithsonian Associates presentation, please check out our show notes. But today, Dr. Lamb will share just a brief interview with us about his latest book, The Masters of Medicine, revealing the mavericks, the moments, and the mistakes that have sparked the greatest medical discoveries of our time, along with insights about his upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation. Dr. Lamb will tell us today about how we as a society should channel our competitive nature for the greater good. How do rivalries shape the advancements that push humanity forward? From the battlefields of ego and personal vendetta between legends like Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch to the contemporary corridors of cutting edge medical research, we are going to explore with Dr. Lamb how these personal conflicts have paradoxically paved the way for innovations that define modern medicine's great episode. So join us for an unforgettable exploration of how in the quest to outdo one another, we often end up doing the best for all. This is not just a lesson from history. It's a blueprint for the future. So stay tuned, engage with curiosity, and let's discover together the incredible ways in which humanity's worst traits have against all odds led to some of our greatest medical achievements. Welcome back to the Not Old Better Show Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast, our returning guest, Dr. Andrew Lamb. Dr. Andrew Lamb, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming back. This is always such a um, a wonderful conversation that, that we have. You and I have talked before, a great presentation that you did at Smithsonian Associates titled, The Only Winner in War is Medicine. We're gonna talk healthcare today, The title of your upcoming presentation is Rivalries in Medicine, How Humanity Can Benefit from the Worst in People. I love that title. So why don't we just start there? Maybe just give us a brief background about what you might say to our audience and how you'll use Zoom to engage everybody. You know, when I wrote my new book, The Masters of Medicine, there were several themes pertaining to medical discoveries that I found very interesting. One, of course, was war, and that was what my last uh, Smithsonian presentation was about how World War II resulted in these marvelous medical innovations that helped all of us. And there were other things as well, like everyone loves serendipitous mistakes, for example. But one factor that surprised me was rivalry. You know, I, I quickly learned that our medical heroes were just as likely to suffer from bad character traits as the rest of us. You know, I'm talking about mm-hmm. jealousy or mm-hmm. self-interest, arrogance or competitiveness. Sometimes these people literally act like children. It, it, it's very entertaining to learn about their fallibility and sometimes their feuds with, with each other. 
Um, and as any fan of reality TV shows knows, you know, watching people behaving badly is always sort of entertaining. <laughs> That's good. Get it. Yep. <laughs> the entertainment. I, I saw that there were, pl- there were times when this rivalry actually proved beneficial because sometimes it was the competition itself that drove these innovators to work harder or faster in their efforts to outdiscover each other. And that's actually what spurred some of our greatest medical breakthroughs. So in this talk um, that I'm going to be doing using Zoom, I'm going to be sharing about various rivalries, like, for example, the one between Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin in the race for the polio vaccine. Or there's another great rivalry between Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, who were these famous microbe hunters that people have, I'm sure, heard about in your audience. Uh, they were in the 19th century, and they kind of loathed each other. You know, they, they, they really hated each other with a passion. And a- another wonderful story that I just want to slip in here is uh, there were these four guys who vied for credit as the discoverer of anesthesia. And this was a long and sordid affair and for some of them, it kind of led to mental illness. It definitely ruined their lives and even contributed to their deaths in some cases. Uh, so, and of course, Zoom is a great way to do a talk like this because, of course, it allows us to reach hundreds of people around the world. And I get a chance to show lots of historic photos and newsreel footage that I think helps people appreciate the past. You know, one example is, you know, I'm preparing this now and uh, you know, I'm trying to recount the kind of the drama and desperation of the era of polio epidemics. And I actually found a f- video which shows workers in New York City just randomly spraying clouds of DDT through the streets of New York City. And they were erroneously thinking that killing mosquitoes might stop polio. And it's incredible to watch this because, you know, it's just a cold, complete waste of time. <laughs> but it shows how they were very ignorant about what caused polio. And it's very easy to draw parallels to what we all experienced during the COVID pandemic, you know, you will remember we were so ignorant. We were literally washing our groceries, you know, in my practice, I was wondering if we should start washing the cash that we were handling. Like we were, Mm. we were truly at a loss to understand that disease for a period of time. And, you know, that's when we don't understand diseases, it's when we get, that's when we get fearful. We try anything to lash out at an unknown enemy. And so those newsreel footage uh, will be very helpful. I think in, in showing people what it might've been like to, kind of confront these terrible diseases. I just think this is going to be so interesting, Dr. Lamb. So, so you touched on Salk and, and Sabin. Tell us a little bit about that rivalry, because that that involves some personal ambition, sure. it, scientific advancement, yeah. all those great things. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great story because everyone kind of remembers and has heard about Salk and Sabin, but probably not many people know about their personal rivalry and how much they disliked each other. Um, because they really didn't like each other very much. But there's no question that it's a great example of how their competition spurred quicker and more effective innovation, probably because they wanted to win or they wanted to beat each other. So um, this, I'll, I'll just tell this very briefly, but as briefly as I can, but I'll, I'll try to do it justice. You know, if, uh, you know, polio was this terrible virus, as you know, that often children would get, but all, adults could get it as well, like Franklin Roosevelt, for example. And it would sometimes, in a certain percentage, would cause paralysis because it would attack the spinal cord. And people knew that the best way to fight it was with a vaccine. But in the mid 20th century, there was a real debate about how to go about making this vaccine. There are two ways of doing it. You could do a live attenuated vaccine or you could do a killed vaccine. So just cutting to the chase, you know, Sabin was the older of the two doctors, of the two scientists, and he favored an attenuated live virus vaccine for polio. So this was actually the approach that most virologists endorse. You know, you're trying to weaken a virus enough that it will not cause the disease, but still uh, would be adequate to elicit an immune response that would allow our immune system to quickly respond if the patient ever were to encounter the polio virus. In contrast, Salk, Jonas Salk was a younger doctor. At this time, at the time this was all going down, he was only in his 30s. And he favored a killed virus vaccine. So this is much easier to make, arguably less dangerous because it can't actually ever cause the disease because it's a killed virus. But the downside was that maybe a killed virus vaccine might not be adequate to make a strong as strong an immune response and therefore might pr- provide a kind of weaker immune protection. So such a vaccine might not last as long. You might need to use annual booster injections, for example. So these were kind of the two different approaches, an attenuated live vaccine versus a killed vaccine. And these two guys were the um, basically the people who advocated for each one. Now, Sabin considered Salk 
a young, excessively striving neophyte. He really had very little respect for Salk. He disrespected Salk at meetings. Here's just one classic example. Once Salk was in a meeting and he asked a question and Saban says to him, now, Dr. Salk, you know better than to ask a question like that. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> Can you imagine having another oh my doctor, doctor talk to you like that in oh. front of all your colleagues? Oh, wow. Like, so much, you know, so condescending, yeah. so disrespectful. And, you know, Salk was humiliated and understandably incensed. So at, at, at other times, Saban would publicly criticize his approach, even after Salk's, as you know, his vaccine came out first. He became the most famous doctor in the world, and his vaccine saved thousands of lives, and the rate of polio uh, plummeted. But even after that, Saban would testify against Salk's vaccine before Congress, questioning its safety and just criticizing it. It was, it was pretty obvious, looking back, that there was plenty of like, self-interest and ego at play. And so, you know, you know that Salk technically won this race because his vaccine came out first. Uh, it, this was in 1955. But it's not that simple. Because Saban was also a brilliant scientist, and later his vaccine was arguably better. You know, it, it, it was oral instead of having an injection, and it could be only it could be given in one dose. So it's a lot easier to give kids like a piece of candy than to inject them multiple times, like three times, to get the salt vaccine. And actually, the U.S. decided to switch to Saban's vaccine in the early '60s over salt, and salt was furious, and I think he was devastated. Because, you know, he opposed Saban's vaccine for years. It was kind of a role reversal. He was always saying, mine's better, you know. And, and more than anything, I think Salk wanted his vaccine to get the credit for eradicating polio fully. And for decades, of course, it appeared maybe Saban was the ultimate winner of this competition. But again, it's a lot of nuance because the dispute continued even after both men died in their 90s. These vaccines, this is where it's, I just find this so fascinating. These vaccines had almost, almost succeeded in ridding the world of polio, but not quite. It got to the point that the only polio cases in, in the developed world were due to the Sabin vaccine. You see, with, an alive, with a live attenuated vaccine, there's always still a very small chance that the virus itself might cause the disease. Maybe if you're like immunosuppressed, for example, it might cause the disease. The chances were so low. It was like two out of a million doses. But because of this, there were maybe uh, there were dozens of cases in the U.S. every year. And so they realized if we just keep using the Saban vaccine, we're never going to eradicate polio. So in 1996, they, the, in the U.S., they decided to try a hybrid program with two Salk vaccine injections and one oral Saban vaccine. But even this did not fully eradicate polio. So in 2000, the CDC actually went back to fully using the Salk vaccine. It's amazing. It's so amazing. this is a tough ups and downs. And, you know, what, it, it's just another, it's just an incredible story of how these guys, it's so ironic, but they were just brilliant. They had a ton of, ton in common. They were both, you know, from modest backgrounds. They were both Jewish Americans who had dedicated themselves to curing polio, but they could never seem to agree that the other guy might also be right. <laughs> and I think that they became each other's sort of nemesis and they each wanted to kind of win personal glory but i'm certain their rivalry spurred them each to develop their vaccines faster which obviously saved lives so there's no question personal ambition i guess has if you combine it with a desire for science scientific advancement it can catalyze innovation without a doubt thank you for that yeah just fascinating amazing rivalries the other name that uh, you mentioned was uh, louis pasteur Tell us a little bit about the rivalry that took place with Pasteur. Yeah. That's a great right. story. I'm, gonna, I, you're gonna, I'm warning you, it's another another story. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I'd love to tell it, but yeah. it's, uh, it might, it might, I'll try to keep it as, as uh, brief as possible. But this is truly a really great one because these guys truly loathed each other. And it became a story of national enmity as well because they were from, Louis Pasteur was from France and Robert Koch was from Germany at a time, this is like in the mid to late 19th century. And they truly, these countries hated each other. In 1870, the Franco-Prussian War occurred and it, it was really, um, it, it kind of, their rivalry got kind of entangled with that. So thanks for letting me share this story. You know, oh, these please. guys were incredible scientists, very briefly, the Cliff Notes version of what they accomplished. Pasteur had basically discovered bacteria. Okay, that's a big one. His other accomplishments included he discovered the first attenuated vaccine for chicken cholera, which was later 
renamed like Pastorella, Pastorella multosida in his honor, mm. and also vaccines for anthrax and rabies. Okay, so we can remember this is a time when people were just dying from infectious diseases, and it was just part of life. Uh, and, you know, people just accepted it. Their children would die at young ages. People would live in their 40s, and that was the average life expectancy. Now, Koch discovered the bacteria that caused anthrax, cholera, and most importantly, tuberculosis, which was the greatest killer of the age. But again, these guys hated each other because they were both vying to be the top scientists in the world, basically. They would attack each other in journals and at meetings. One, here's just one example. At a big conference in Geneva in 1882, after Koch had written a, in a journal that he thought Pasteur's vaccines were worthless and bunk and they wouldn't work, Pasteur was vigorously defending himself on the podium. And Koch was literally sitting in the front row, feet away from him. And during the speech, Koch jumped up and started waving his arms around, trying to shut up Pasteur. And it was it must have been hilarious and a very disturbing scene to see. And their, you know, it, it, their arguments were in all the newspapers and the journals, and French citizens were incensed whenever Koch would attack Pasteur and vice versa, I'm sure. So this, this again, was a, like at a time, just to mention, when technological advancements like electricity and the telephone were being made, and it was an age in which colonialism in Africa and Asia were dependent on these advances in tropical medicine. So each country's scientists were being put on pedestals and lauded as national figures. And in trying to do, outdo each other, without a doubt, just like with Salk and Saban, they made great discoveries. But I can tell you sometimes when I mentioned how doctors and scientists sometimes become guilty of like arrogance and, and self-interest and make mistakes. Here's a great example because Koch made a terrible mistake. He had ironically once been a very humble doctor in this rural Polish town. But after he became world famous as the discoverer of many deadly bacteria, he became very arrogant. And in 1890, he made this astounding claim. He said he had discovered the cure for tuberculosis, which is just incredible. It'd be like today, somebody saying they had cured cancer, okay? Because about a quarter of deaths worldwide in the late 19th century were due to TB. So people were flocking to Germany to like find out about the discovery and patients all over the world were like coming there to be cured. But the problem was he had not really tested this material, which he called tuberculin with the same meticulousness that he had been known for in all his other discoveries. And it turned out the medicine didn't actually work. Mm. And in some cases made the disease even worse. So it was terrible. He was humiliated. And a lot of people believe he was pressured to announce that cure uh, by German government officials who were kind of impatient to tout another German medical triumph. So again, here, here's just an example where excessive competition accompanied by greed and egotism led to mistakes and a very harmful effect for both the investigator and the patients, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but it's, it's, a, it's a good lesson because I think it's important that competition, to, to acknowledge that competition is a good thing if you can successfully harness the personal ambition for good, right? Mm -hmm. Because no doubt all of us, you know, we're motivated when we're incentivized and whether it's financial or, or, or reputational or altruism is, is a motivator too. But these, these, these guys were working much harder uh, because they pushed each other and competed with each other. Hi, it's Paul. Do you love entertaining, informative, eclectic, insightful programs about culture, health, science, life, and everything Smithsonian? As part of our Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast, we're introducing you to the new Smithsonian Associates streaming series. Smithsonian, a nonprofit organization, is excited to present this new aspect of their 55 years as the world's largest museum-based educational program. Join us from the comfort of your home as we periodically interview Smithsonian Associate guest speakers. Our audience here on radio and podcast can explore our website for more information, links, and details at notold-better.com. Thanks, everybody. Again, our guest today is returning Smithsonian Associate Dr. Andrew Lamb. Andrew Lamb will be appearing at Smithsonian Associates coming up. Check out our show notes today for more details. Dr. Lamb is author of the new book, The Masters of Medicine, Our Greatest Triumphs in the Race to Cure Humanity's Deadliest Diseases. 
talking to us today, though, about his upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation, Rivalries in Medicine, How Humanity Can Benefit from the Worst in People. Dr. Lamb, I, I've gotten to know you a little bit. I certainly have found you to be such a professional, and you're so highly regarded uh, in the profession as an, as an eye surgeon, an author, and so much more that you do. Congratulations on this work. It is just fascinating. How has all of this research into these rivalries influenced your own approach to to medicine and and collaboration specifically in the in the scientific community? Because I, I I can't imagine that you you're trash talking your colleagues out there. The... Yeah, I mean, I think that first of all, I'm glad I don't personally have any professional rivals that I'm personally competing <laughs> yes. to outdo. Yeah, right. so that's number one. Yeah. Um, I do think that medicine today is a lot more polite than it used to be. You know, it's not cool to go to a medical meeting or a conference and be mean to each other. <laughs> well, but I, and I do think that personally, you can't, when you do all this research about medical discoveries and the heroes and the giants of the field, you can't help but feel really inspired and think to yourself, God, I feel like I should be doing a lot more than I'm doing. Like, look at what these geniuses did for mankind. I should get off my butt and, do, and go discover something, right? Uh, but, you know, the, re- the reality is I kind of get myself a little off the hook because it's really hard to make discoveries. You have to have this confluence of genius and hard work and being in the right place at the right time, which often requires luck. And it's rare to have all those things happen in one person's life. You know, I, I'm certainly very active in uh, like these. In my field of retina, it's very exciting. There's a lot of new medications always being investigated and, and, and discovered. So we're, we're part of like a... Um, Academically, I, I, I'm participating in a lot of these national clinical trials that help investigate these medicines. And, and, and at, this, at this day and age, you know, there's a lot of scale involved in, you know, getting new medicines FDA approved and stuff. But I, I think that, you know, these lessons in competition show that you just have to – competition, it's like sports. Mm-hmm. competition helps us and drives us, but mm-hmm. you can't go overboard. You, you can't go to the point where you're doing things, you're taking too many shortcuts. You, you know, when people get lose sight of why you're doing it, you start doing it only for personal glory. That's when you get problems like plagiarism or cheating and lying. So the, the, there are so many lessons in history and if people don't pay attention. They are doomed to repeat it. So there's no question about that. Well, thank you. And, and, uh, uh, again, I, I just think this is this is so fascinating about these personal rivalries. But today, the competition is between nations. Maybe that's a, a good way to put it mm-hmm. here, U.S. and China. And so tell us a little bit about how – really- yeah, please. No, yeah. I'm, you know, that's a really good observation you made. And if I think about it, that's right. You know, right now, you know, I don't really see personal rivalries becoming common. You know, there, there, there's um, – you know, it, it's rare to have like nationally known doctors trying to fight a very famous disease and there's only two opposing ways to do it. You know, that that's not likely to be the future. I think those we see rivals more in like other fields like technology, for example, like, I'm, you know, it could be like Elon Musk versus Jeff Bezos versus Mark Zuckerberg kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But in medicine, I do think there is some a danger of like these national rivalries becoming an issue, like what you said, like sort of like what happened to Pasteur and Coke in France and Germany. They were being goaded on by this national thing. And an example um, that I actually wrote about near the end of my book uh, was the uh, a possible rivalry between U.S. and China, and especially with this particular issue of germline gene editing. So um, very briefly, you know, people are probably aware CRISPR is this incredible uh, method of doing gene editing. You can literally use this CRISPR method to take out genes that, it, you know, you can cure diseases. If you take out a deleterious gene or sometimes you replace that with a, a better gene, a, a proper gene. And we've already been using this to like solve things like sickle cell anemia and things like that. And so nobody really objects to using gene therapy to solve, to cure diseases. Um, in a one-off way to what we call somatic cells, which are normal cells like bone cells or skin cells or muscle cells. But the controversy comes when you genetically modify what's called a germline cell, which is a sperm or an egg cell, because as you know, this is going to lead to future humans. And once you've made a alteration in the genome of one of those cells, you literally change the human genome. And this will, you know, it's, 
it's possible, frankly, to create genetically modified humans or what some people call designer babies, right? So you can easily see the slippery slope where you start saying, oh, let's treat this baby or this, let's create a baby that has a less chance of developing this disease and you have good intentions. But there might be a lot of unintended consequences because you don't know what every, what the function of every gene is. Like there might be other genes other functions that that gene has that we just aren't aware of yet because this is the infancy of gene therapy. Or you might argue, well, instead of doing it for disease, let's make my child more tall or more beautiful or more strong, right? So it's like basically opening up the controversy and ethical controversy that were science fiction before, like in Gattaca or in Brave New New World, right? Mm -hmm. So right now, not surprisingly, it's considered unethical to create a genetically modified human. And the U.S. and over 75 countries have basically said it's not ethical. You can't do it. But in China in 2018, a scientist did it. So the genie was out of the bottle in 2018. I'm sure if you, if you looked at a headline, you remember this story, this Chinese doctor created two babies with modified CCR5 genes, which was supposed to make them resistant to HIV infection. So the CCR5 gene makes a protein that allows HIV to enter cells. So he basically changed it. So it's, Technically, these kids would, these two, do, two girls that were born and looked totally healthy would hopefully make them resistant to HIV. Um, but there was immediate widespread criticism about this from around the world. You know, everyone in America, I'm sure, was worried that this was going to lead to like, you know, this rogue scientist from maybe a rogue country was going to lead to a genetic therapy arms race. Because can you imagine, you know, you're a scientist in America and you're respecting this more, this like careful ethical moratorium. But now you're worried that another country or another scientist is going to go ahead. And then it'd be very difficult to resist going forward with your own research because you don't want to fall behind. Right. And so there was a bit of a sigh of relief because this scientist was rebuked by other Chinese scientists and was actually convicted of a crime and is now and went to jail. Thank God. But, you know, just like in personal rivalries, there can be pros and cons to national rivalries. And so there's an example of how, you know, cutting edge science can sometimes conflict uh, when these countries, you know, the, the conflict between nations gets in the way. And we're seeing it in, in technology all the time, right? Just think about AI, you know, just think about mm-hmm. all the things you hear in the news about Chinese AI, or, you know, we're worried about their telecom companies spying on us or their products spying on us, right? And so it's going to be an interesting rest of the century, I guess. Um, I, I, I just hope that, you know, in science, there are times I think when, you know, if you gotta, you gotta adhere to scientific ethical, um, ethics, sometimes even if they ha- they supersede your national priorities, like I'm sure like Robert Koch was being goaded by German politicians who don't even understand science to like beat Pasteur, beat France. And maybe he was influenced on, uh, unfortunately by by these external factors that made him lose sight of the importance of science. Science, the beauty of science is it's the search for truth. It doesn't matter. Science doesn't care which country wins. It doesn't care who's disappointed, who loses money, which company goes bankrupt. It's truth. Mm. And I think that, you know, scientists, as you know, are just, they're all, we're all, it's all, we're all susceptible to the same um, influences as everybody else. We can, you know, people can be corrupted. People can be influenced in negative ways. Um, so we all have to try our best. You know, as a scientist, you're, you're always aware of people's conflict, conflicts of interest. The people you're talking to should be aware of your disclosures. If you're listening to a lecture, you need to know where, where they're coming from and things like that. So that's a little bit of what we're facing in this century anyway. Dr. Andrew Lamb, Smithsonian Associates, been our guest. Just fascinating, all of this work. Again, congratulations on your research into these historical instances of, of rivalry that have just led to medical breakthroughs, but also real challenges personally throughout, throughout time. Thank you. We're looking forward to your presentation. We will have more information about Dr. Lamb, his new book, Masters of Medicine, and his upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation in our notes today. But Dr. Lamb, thanks for coming back, and I look forward to talking to you again. I know that you're going to just have just a bunch of wonderful things to share with us in the future, too. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. My thanks to Smithsonian Associate Dr. Andrew Lamb. Smithsonian Associate Dr. Andrew Lamb will be appearing at Smithsonian Associates coming up, and the title of his presentation is 
rivalries in medicine, how humanity can benefit from the worst in people. For more information about Dr. Lamb's Smithsonian Associates presentation, please check out our show notes today. My thanks always to the Smithsonian team for all they do to support the show. My thanks always to you, my wonderful audience here on radio and podcast. Please be well, be safe, and let's talk about better. The Not All Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. Thanks, everybody. We will see you next week. Thanks for joining us this week on the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast.